Through collaboration, research, and policy engagement, we aim to unlock the potential of e-fuels in reducing greenhouse gas emissions and fostering a sustainable energy future. Today, we like to present a webinar that will deepen our understanding and address the complexities surrounding the red two delegated acts for hydrogen and e-fuels production. These acts focusing on the detailed rules for production of renewable fuels of non-biological origin, that's the so-called RFNBO, and the methodology for assessing greenhouse gas emissions savings from RFNBOs, and recycled carbon fuels, the so-called RCFs, are crucial in the EU's journey towards a more sustainable and renewable energy future. We have waited for the delegated acts for quite a while. Since the RAD2 got published in December 2018, it was clear that a clear guideline is required for a future hydrogen market. The Commission has missed its own deadline by the end of 2021 by more than a year. It got finally adopted in summer 2023, but many questions are still not answered. A few weeks ago, the Commission updated their Q&A document, which includes 68 questions and three annexes that we want to discuss today. Please allow me one critical remark. Still, no certification body has been approved by DGNL until now. How to take final investment decisions if no certifier is approved? How to achieve the interim target of the European hydrogen strategy of 6 GWe in 2024 with such a delay? To be clear, as the EFIL Alliance, we are not against the delegated X, but we think they are too restrictive and too complex for an early market phase. For that reason, we call for an early revision after the next European election and for a general exemption and grandfathering of the first GV electrolysis capacity in Europe. This would benefit first movers and initiate an immediate market ramp up, which we need urgently. Why is this workshop crucial? It is our portal to expert insights from distinguished speakers, including Bernd Kupta from the, from the Director General for Energy of the European Commission and Timo Winkelmann from RedCert GmbH. Their perspective will support us towards not only understanding, but also mastering the delegated acts, ensuring compliance and leveraging strategic planning for renewable fuel production. Moreover, this uh, workshop is a platform for interaction and engagement. Through the Q&A session moderated by Dr. Tobias Block, we encourage you to voice your queries share your concerns and seek advice. This is your opportunity to directly engage with experts and peer alike, ensuring that your unique questions are addressed. Thank you for joining us today and thank you to the experts that they will help us to understand it all better. And I'm handing now over to Tobias Block to take the moderation. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Monica, uh, for those introductionary um, remarks. Uh, Monica is our chairwoman of the eFuel Alliance. My name is Tobias Block. I'm responsible for strategy and content within the eFuel Alliance, and I'm happy to moderate this webinar with you. Um, as we already heard, it's a quite urgent topic um, that we need to discuss. Um, there are a lot of details um, today. And I hope I can, I can structure and explain it as best as possible. I don't want to, to waste further time. And I would like to start with our first speaker. And I'm happy to introduce Bernd Kupke to you. Uh, Bernd Kupke is working on energy topics in the Commission since 2012. Um, I think if you're working in Brussels, you have to get to know him. Um, he is dealing with Renewable Energy Directive. Um, the gas package and, and many, many other topics as well. He's the experts uh, when it comes to decarbonization and sustainability of energy sources. And 
he has some introductory um, remarks um, for us um, before we entering the Q and A session, and also explaining changes in the recent update of the Q and A document on the delegated acts of RMBO production. Bernd, um, this is your stage. Um, please, please start uh, with your um, speech. Thanks a lot. Um, I will try to keep it uh, brief and and uh, many thanks for inviting me. Um, I think first um, we I mean we need to stake uh, a bit of stock where we are with regards to the setting up the the, the framework for the promotion of, of renewable and low carbon fuels, uh, including e fuels. And I think we have achieved uh, quite a lot over the last years. Uh, we have now um, a whole set of targets for these fuels in place, which is now being um, implemented uh, by the member states, in particular the, the targets for the Renewable Energy Directive. Um, but all, not only that, we also have um, instruments for promoting renewable fuels in aviation, and we have uh, instruments for promoting um, decarbonization in in the maritime sector, so we have these, these pull instruments in place. Uh, we have um, now um, a detailed set for the certification um, of, of renewable fuels of non-biosure origin, as well as, as market rules, which have been established in, in the gas de decarbonization package, which also include um, an empowerment for the commission to set out rules for uh, determining emission savings um, of, of low carbon fuels, which com uh, which complements the certification framework for renewable fuels set out in the Renewable Energy Directive. <clears throat> and then we have various um, instruments to really directly support the the uptake of um, <clears throat> of um, of, of um, hydrogen and uh, renewable fuels, including the European Hydrogen Bank, but not only that. However, it is also clear that the complex um, framework that also our work uh, is going on. Um, recently, um, the Commission has adopted um, a delegated act which aligns the, the um, R from BO uh, delegated act with the revised renewable energy directive by changing um, the relevant terms in the in the directive. We will also do that, or we also plan to do the same for the emission calculation methodology. Um, this we will also do this year, possibly together with um, setting out the rules for cal calculating emission savings of uh, low carbon fuels. With regard to certification, uh, we are also doing progress. We have assessed um, or we have first received a number of deputations of voluntary schemes, which are interesting in, in doing certification of renewable hydrogen and, and e-fuels. Uh, we have um, conducted a first assessment, sent feedback, and now the schemes are preparing um, revised documents, which um, um, yeah, which then hopefully fulfill all the requirements if, if they do. Then we can um, we can start the uh, the formal recognition process. Our aim for the finalization of the technical assessment is end of this quarter, and as soon as we have kind of a technical positive um, uh, setup, we can already indicate on our website that that we uh, so as as Enner consider that the the schemes are, are good, and then in parallel we will then launch the the process of of the recognition. Of the schemes, we also worked um, on an update of the Q and A document, which we will discuss further later on. We made um, we we added additional questions to address further uh, questions. We also um, clarified a, a, a couple of questions where uh, where yeah we got feedback from from uh, from stakeholders. Um, I will not go into details into that now. I will only mention maybe the, the kind of the three main um, issues which we have addressed. First of all, we have updated uh, the question on the role of intermediaries in PPAs, um, which provides a bit more flexibility. It's a bit more open to, or an open 
um, decision at the uh, or it did an open uh, description of the role of intermediaries and in the first version of the Q&A. At the same time, it explicitly mentions the, the main requirements which uh, have to be fulfilled. Further, we added one key element, which is uh, a description of the effective carbon pricing system. This, as the whole document, is of course not a legally binding um, approach. The document only helps to provide um, um, guidance, both for the certification, but also to kind of express a bit uh, our technical view how this matter should be assessed. Um, but at um, and but at the same time, well, it is important for 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 the sector. On uh, this effective carbon pricing system, we also added a number of um, uh, of our countries, which in our view already fulfill these criteria, um, and this uh, and also announced that um, that this list can can be ex uh, expanded in the future. Uh, we still have to set out the detailed process for that, but. Um, we generally will work on this uh, very closely together with our experts in the Directorate General of Climate Change, which are really the experts about uh, carbon pricing. And um, yeah, we'll provide more and more information how how this will look at uh, we, how this will be done uh, done in practice. But the general idea is that if we come to a conclusion that um, that there are other countries that we will further add new. Um, names or new countries to the positive list, uh, which is set out in in the annex of the Q and A document. Further, maybe not at the first sight uh, the most important. We also included um, one uh, question in the Q A, pointing at the possibility of voluntary schemes to do pre audits. This is not only um important for for the pre-auditing but it also is important uh, to to know that we see for the implementation of the requirements a um, central role of the certification schemes also in advising um the uh, of working closely together with the um with the operators in in the context of the implementation of the uh, projects because not all questions can easily be addressed and, and sufficiently um, um, uh, assessed uh, in, in meetings or, or in letters. So it is really uh, important that, that um, the situation is, uh, is assessed on the spot, um, knowing all the details of the, of the project in place. So with this, uh, I would hand, like to hand back then to, to BS. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Bernd, for this uh, introduction. Um, I would like to to go on um, with uh, Timo Winkelmann. Um, Timo um, is working for the certification body Red Cert. He has a Master of Chemistry from the University of Münster. Um, he focused on electrochemistry and in particular on the development of sustainable uh, cathode materials for batteries. Uh, interesting that you are now dealing with renewable fuels. Um, Timo, you have some slides for us um, explaining what RegCert is doing and how to certify hydrogen and e-fuels. Please, you have the stage. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. And yeah, just a comment. I mean, uh, yeah, um, uh, the saving of electricity or the uh, electricity to transferring it to an energy product is not only possible within a battery but also in a fuel so therefore the there's an interlink between both of the worlds of an elect uh, to provide the energy to a car for example or another um, transport vehicle so just i have a look to talk uh, see if i find the correct slides okay not the one um there it should be. So, just uh, for confirmation, you're seeing now the screen, the presentation, yes. correct? Yeah, it's working. Thanks. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I want to uh, talk a little bit about the renewable fuels of non biological origin within our Red Set EU scheme. And I'm really happy to see that a large number of people here um, to, to um, 
yeah, follow this whole discussion and I try to keep it short in order to have enough room for discussion because personally, I think a discussion is always worth it to have uh, in order to get a better understanding, also to get a common understanding. When it comes to certifications, this is most, the most crucial part to have a level playing field for all uh, yeah, certified companies on the market. So first, allow me to leave some words about RedCert and who we are specifically. RedCert has been founded in 2010 by leading organizations from the agricultural and biofuel sector. And the reason for RedCert to be founded was the entry into force of the Renewable Energy Directive back then. Um, and the aim was, and still is today, to have a practical approach when it comes to certification, um, especially in the biofuel sector. But as I will show on the next slide, we will also uh, include the renewable fuels of non-biological origin as well as the recycling carbon fuels within our certification scheme. Since then, we have more than 2,000 customers in Europe and uh, beyond that are deciding for our certification schemes. And we have already three operating scheme, uh, certification schemes in operation for different industries. The one is the fuel sector in general, more or less. And then we have a food and feed industry and a chemical industry, both of them are also targeting sustainable aspects like sustainable farming and the other one is using sustainable materials or recycled materials within the chemical industry um, and that this entire process is then certified on the level of a company. And whenever we are talking about certification, we are talking about a so-called third-party certification approach and for this we are uh, partnering with more than 30 certi about certi certification bodies. And about this certification approach, I want to, um, yeah, I want to spend some time here uh, on this approach today. Um, the certification scheme of interest when it comes to renewable fuels of non-biological origin, at least from uh, our company, is the Red CTU scheme. And the Red CTU scheme is the one that focuses uh, on the certification in the context of the Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, today, we have the recognition for biofuels, uh, bioliquids and biomass fuels in the context of uh, their sustainability criteria that they need to fulfill um, according to the Renewable Energy Directive. And we are currently seeking, as uh, Mr. Kupka already pointed out, also the recognition um, for to show, demonstrate compliance with the criteria um, yeah, co um, in the context of renewable fuels of non-biological origin, recycled carbon fuels, and also there's another one, the co-processing of biofuels. And uh, maybe some of you already have seen this on the so-called voluntary schemes page. This is also publicly shown. We are currently seeking the extension uh, of, the, of the scope for RFMBO and RCF, and we will um, soon send in the revised documentation as a Q&A uh, document also gave us some additional information required to get a new set of documents sent to the, uh, yeah, to the commission. And we are currently expecting uh, the recognition in the summer or the early summer this year. So therefore, we are really looking forward uh, to get the certification scheme on the market to have a recognized scheme for, for demonstrating the compliance to national authorities and so on when it comes to renewable fuel of non-biological origin production. And this slide uh, should show how the entire certification process um, on when it comes to the Renewable Energy Directive is working. Um, so first of all, we have the Re Renewable Energy Directive that requires certification, voluntary schemes like ours, to um, have a certification scheme in place that is, um, is uh, sufficient to ensure that the rules uh, or the requirements that are set out in the Renewable Energy Directive are, um, are fulfilled by, by the industry, by economic operators, everyone involved in the entire value chain of a fuel like the RFMBO, meaning that we as a certification scheme uh, operator or provider, we are developing our set, uh, our set of documents based on the new rules or amended rules and send them into the European Commission in order to get recognized. After this recognition, we again, companies can show, choose our certification scheme in order to show the compliance with the rules set out in the Renewable Energy Directives, Delegators Act and so on, everything which is important for the certification. And then the certification approach um, is uh, this the one of the third party certification as mentioned before. Meaning not we as a voluntary scheme uh, or certification scheme are the ones conducting or carrying out the certification process. This is all in the hand of a so-called certification body. And these are listed publicly with uh, on our homepage um, that, that are uh, yeah, con 
using our rule book, so to say, and carrying out the certification using our um, certification relevant documentation in order to check whether a company fulfills the requirements set out in our certification scheme. So the certification body is the one in charge of the certification process, as well as the certification is the issuance of a certificate and the um, yeah, um, ensuring that the company is um, fulfilling the requirements with our certification scheme. And this certificate is also publicly visible on our homepage in order to have a transparent um, set of, of details for, for each uh, company in the, in the value chain to see which company is allowed to sell uh, or deliver RFMBO hydrogen or RFMBO fuel, for example. And to add another layer of insurance to this pr uh, process, we have national authorities and also accreditation bodies that are uh, monitoring the certification bodies, not all, everything in, in the context of the Renewable Energy Directive, but everything which is ensured, uh, ensures a common or a harmonized certification approach throughout every certification body. And if every company of a value chain decides to um, follow uh, the certification approach or this certification approach, a so-called chain of custody is ensured. And this is um, <clears throat> depicted here on this slide. And I know that there's a lot of going on on this slide, but I wanted to highlight just a few things in order to um, yeah, show how this chain of custody certification approach works. So we have, an, uh, we have on the left-hand side, we have an input in between there's the entire value chain. And then we have the, the output and in this um, example here, this is a hydrogen, for example, or an RFMBO um, of any type that may arise from such a value chain. And what the chain of custody certification ensures is that between the claim made here on the output that this is a renewable fuel of non-biological or origin, that there's always a corresponding amount of sustainable input into the value chain there present. And when it comes to sustainable input or inputs with criteria attached to it, we have the electricity part here, um, which needs to be renewable and in, um, which more or less directly influences the classification of being recognized as a renewable fuel of non-biological origin. And we have the carbon dioxide, which indirectly by uh, being accounted for under the GHG, greenhouse gas emission calculation methodology that indirectly inf influences if something can be sold, for example, as a renewable fuel of non-biological origin. And this sustainability characteristics here in, uh, in the beginning, for example, the electricity, is transferred through the entire value chain of, of this fuel, meaning that um, each company here needs to be certified according to our standard or another voluntary scheme and prove the compliance with the delegated act. And among this is, for example, also the transference, transfer of data um, when it comes to sustainable characteristics like the GHG emission, emissions that needs to be transferred through the value chain. And further processing and the, the requirements here are most of um, most of the time step specific by the electrolyzer needs to prove that the electricity is renewable. The further processing steps need to, for example, um, prove that the carbon dioxide that they're using is creditable under the um, greenhouse gas emission calculation. And by this, it's ensured that everything is traced through the entire value chain. And if one link of this chain is not compliant, then no RFMBO, for example, can be arise out of this um, value chain. As I already mentioned, uh, there are some sustainability aspects important, and, and I think a lot of people are already quite familiar with the delegated acts and their um, requirements on, for example, electricity and also the carbon dioxide later. Um, but I just want to um, briefly go through it because we are to always talking about electricity used as an input meaning um, that the electricity used as an input needs to, form, uh, to be renewable. All other electricity like running infrastructure, uh, pumps and so on is not, only, not specifically required to be renewable. And we have a partially renewable electricity that can be used and we have fully renewable electricity that can be used. Um, partially as, as the name already says, is an, only has a sh certain share of renewable electricity and corresponding with this type of electricity, we have greenhouse gas emissions that are rise and we have a fully renewable electricity where 100% of the electricity can be considered as renewable and we have there an emission factor that can be assumed to be zero. And when it comes to the fully renewable electricity production, uh, we have three major um, yeah, cri criteria that are important. This is the additionality, the temporal correlation and the geographic correlation. The um, 
yeah, requirements on this particular parts are, are listed below in a um, summarized matter, but what is important specifically for the um, economic operators of fuel producer using this type of electricity or uh, using electricity for the production of the fuel as an input again. And they have to have a place, what we call an electricity to fuel balance. I mean, the, uh, most of you are maybe already aware about the term mass balance. This is one something that is later on in the value chain quite important, but um, when it comes to the electrolysis or the process of electrolysis, we are talking about electricity to fuel balance, which needs to be in, um, in line with the temporal correlation set out here. On the last few slides, I want to talk a little bit about the greenhouse gas emission uh, calculation, and then um, uh, I think we can di uh, directly head into the uh, discussion. Uh, first of all, the renewable fuel of non-biological origin needs to save at least 70% um, yeah, greenhouse gas emissions. And this is compared to the fossil fuel uh, comparator down below here. Um, and it's in this calculation, each emission arising due to the production of the fuel um, needs to be accounted for, meaning emissions from the input, processing, transport, and distribution, and specifically the use of the fuel. And this is something that's different to the biofuel, where the use of the fuel, for example, in a uh, road car, um, is, can be neglected because biogenic CO2 under this uh, criteria is uh, considered a zero emission. In case of an RFMBO, this is different. We have to account for this, but in order to be able to compensate this, we have the existing use of fate on this, on this right-hand side here, uh, where we can credit carbon dioxide that is for, uh, introduced into the structure of the fuel. Uh, and for this, certain requirements are there. And this is just summarized on my last slide, um, carbon dioxide, which is creditable under the EXUs. Um, we have multiple point of origins, and also when it comes to certification, uh, different approaches here. The most easiest part is, uh, I think, for example, the direct air capture, which yeah, mainly will, uh, I think, have in close proximity to the fuel producer. So there's a direct connection, for example, to this plant um, or from geological source, um, which is released naturally. Um, yeah, we will see uh, what will come by this. Other part is the production of biofuels. This is already covered, already covered also within our certification scheme. So there's a transfer of sustainability characteristics is quite straightforward when, for example, like referring to the certificate. And other approaches or point of origins um, of carbon dioxide needs to be addressed uh, somehow in the certification process of the fuel producer specifically. And there we will most likely see a group certification approach where um, where we see uh, where a sample is taken, for example, from, from such um, carbon dioxide sources to see whether the carbon dioxide is really applicable to be um, credited under the excuse term. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is basically everything that I wanted to um, share to, with you today. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion and yeah, to get a common understanding about this approach, uh, certification approach. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Timo. Um, I think now we all know what the delegated acts are about and what Red Search is um, doing. Um, I would like to, to start the Q&A session now, and I have to say I'm really impressed by the number of participants. Uh, we have more than 330 um, participants online. Um, I think this shows the high interest in that topic, and we already have 20 questions in the Q&A session. Um, Bernd, I would like to start with you um, and some administrative questions. Um, Timo said that um, he thinks first certification bodies like Red Cert will get approved um, beginning of summer this year. Um, I would um, like to know if you have more information about that uh, when um, the, the first um, improvements will take place. And then in the chat, I've seen that there are also questions about the legal um, binding um, of, of such Q&A document. Um, I also got another question um, in front from Fuels Europe. What happens if there are contradictions between the interpretation of a certification body and, and the commission? Um, maybe you can give us some insights um, about the administrative part here. 
you still have to unmute yourself, please. So maybe starting with the question about the timeline. Um, so the timeline for the um, for the uh, recognition depends obviously on the process of the of the assessment. Also, it, this means that the schemes have to submit um, yeah scheme documents which are ready, and there is an iterative process in a way. So if a scheme fails to submit um, good um, uh, yeah, documentation, then of course we cannot finalize the, the, the assessment, but we think it should be possible um, to come to yeah, stable uh, versions of the, of the scheme documents um, by end of uh, the second quarter. And then at this stage, then we would launch then the process for the recognition via the commission implementing decision. So and we would also then put on our website the sign that this scheme fulfills technical um, technical um, yeah requirements, and then member states are also then already kind of um, yeah then, then they can also they are encouraged and already to accept the evidence from from the scheme. Generally, fully legally, um, the the commission recognition. Uh, only serves the purpose to require member states to accept evidence from the certification schemes, meaning they can already accept uh, the schemes now if they wish so. Um, but of course, having well an assessment and then the formal recognition is of uh, provides more and more assurances uh, about the future and also more certainty for for our actors involved. So therefore, we are. Uh, we aim to to finalize this as soon as possible. Then, with regard to the uh, legal bindingness of the Q and A, well, it's not legally binding. We try to um, provide um, guidance uh, to, in particular, to the certifiers how we we see that uh, this certification can be done. It is also then informative for our assessment, which we are doing. So we. We, we the schemes which then follow this line then can be uh, safe that that also yeah in the recognition process we will also keep keep this line and then accept uh, the approach if it is in line with the uh, with this Q and A otherwise well it's not legally binding and therefore uh, member states if they consider for instance that um, the rules are different they they can deviate if they if they are sure that this is not um, yeah, that is it is not valid. So that's generally the the situation you have with all non-binding documents. The Commission cannot just set out um, yeah on on a piece of paper on the website and then argue that it's legally binding. In the end, it would be only the the court who can arrive at uh, at a final interpretation of the renewal energy directive and its delegated acts. Um, when, um, um, well, if it's implemented non-correctly by, I mean, by uh, by the auditors, I would not expect that this happens because, in a way, we we are providing the this guidance in particular to the certifiers to do it in the way that uh, that it is in line with with our interpretation. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. Maybe maybe a short question, additional question on that. Um, that means that member states have to implement the delegated acts in in the national law, like like Germany already did. Is it right? Well, I mean, member states, the renewable energy directive is uh, is a directive, and they can, as part of the directive, set out um, frameworks to accept to to implement it. And this also means that they have to accept um, if uh, if the fuel supplier supplies um, towards. Uh, Support mechanism in a member state's um, um, a fuel um, that the member states need to decide whether it it is correct what the uh, fuel supplier does or or not. And the most typical way is then indeed to rely on the recognized certification schemes, but they can also have own mechanisms uh, which um, which own which own checks. So that's not not something which is excluded by by the directive okay thanks thanks a lot 
Um, I've got one question um, before that meeting from a Swedish um, e-fuel startup um, about um, the mass balancing of the CO2 stream. Um, they want like to use biogenic CO2 from a municipal solid waste um, factory. In the Q&A document, you say um, that the time period for balancing the CO2 is three months. And um, they would like to know the reason behind it, um, because, um, of course, if um, heat is produced in such a um, base factory, then, um, um, of course, much more biogenic CO2 would be available during the winter period. Um, so a larger e-fuel production could be connected if an annual mass balancing um, is possible in comparison to, to a quarterly uh, mass balancing. Um, can you can you elaborate on that? Uh, maybe it's again a question to Bernd. There, I mean, first of all, what I mean, what the the Q and A aims to achieve is to clarify that indeed a mass balance can be used, and you do not need to rely physically on what is actually in every second of the of the of the stream, which is you know how much the biogenic. Uh, content is is uh, is is true, um, but however, if we go then to the mass balance system, I mean there are rules for a mass balance system, and they're setting up, they're set out in an implementing regulation on certification, um, and there there are two cases. One case is that you use a three months three months uh, period, and one case is that you use twelve months. But the twelve months does not apply um to to all cases but only to to agriculture um so these rules would need to be changed to change the um yeah, the mass balance period so at this stage we relied um on um on the existing legislation okay thanks uh, thanks a lot and then there's an additional question from exxon mobile um they ask and um, if their assumption is correct and um, that that would mean um, that um, CO2 streams um, connected by grid or pipeline network um, from multiple input sources like fossil the direct air capturing or biogenic sources could be used following the rules of mass balancing. Well, in principle, that's that's possible. I mean, we would need to to look a bit how to implement this in the union database or whether it would need to be in, included. So we have not looked at this specific case, of really um, a kind of a network for that. But in principle, uh, the use of the mass balance system is not um, not excluded. Okay, I think that's interesting for, for some some operators. Um, Timo, I think the next question is, is more for you. Um, I got a question from BIMCO, the world's uh, largest shipping association with over 2,000 members. And um, they said, uh, what about subsidies that you get on the electricity side or on the fuel side um, if the fuel is produced outside of the EU? Um, for example, with the Inflation Reduction Act in the US and then used, um, for, to, for example, to apply on the fuel you maritime. Um, with the RFMBO amounts, um, can you give us a short overview about um, what rules we have for different subsidies? So, from from our understanding, when it comes to subsidies, only the electricity side is important. So that the installation generating the renewable electricity uh, is not subject to direct uh, yeah, subsidies. The fuel producer itself. This is um, yeah not directly addressed when it comes to subsidies. So the electricity production is the one that is important when it comes to subsidies. Okay, can you say a bit more what kind of electricity so, um, subsidies um, that includes? Um, is it um, if you if you have feed in if you have got feed in tariffs for example, um, or other um, capex or opex um, subsidies and um, um, so is it, if I get cheap renewable electricity, I'm, I'm not allowed to use it anymore? Um, so this is um, just when it comes to um, the, yes, so that the electricity is not uh, directly yeah, credited twice, so to say. So 
Um, it's not for uh, building, for example, the plant from, from our understanding, but the electricity like feed-in tariffs may be accounted for as, as a subsidy from, from my understanding. Just... Okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, then I would like to talk about um, what it means, what is an effective carbon pricing mechanism. Um, this is, I think, one of the um, largest update in the latest Q&A document. Um, as you know, industrial CO2 point sources for e-fuel production are only allowed until 2041, and they have to be um, in an effective carbon pricing. Um, the, the Commission um, has further clarified this in the annex um, of, of the latest Q&A document, and um, you say um, it has to be a robust monitoring, reporting and verification it need to be binding on participants, it need to be stable, um, it need to um, ensure stringent enforcement, uh, government-led, and um, be in line with the Paris um, climate goals. Uh, and also the, the carbon price um, um, should apply to the whole sector, uh, which is producing the RFMBOs. Um, I think it's good to have these additional criteria but I would like to ask um, both of you, um, Bernd and Tim Timo, how to interpret this. I've seen in the chat that there is a question from Transport on Environment, for example, what, what is an effective carbon price or what, how high the carbon price should be? Um, uh, I know that India, for example, also already applied for the carbon border adjustment mechanism where, where we probably are facing the same questions. Um, so um, how, how to interpret this? Um, maybe starting with you, Timo, and then, then go to, to Bernd. So from, from our perspective, when it comes to the next uh, to the question answer document, uh, we received a, uh, from our point of view, a clear guidance so that we need to stick to the list uh, included in the annex when it comes to uh, seeing an effective carbon yeah, considering a carbon price as an effective carbon pricing. So we are more or less dependent on the positive list here. And um, so uh, from, from a voluntary schemes perspective, this is uh, an approach which ensures that the um, there's a uh, common understanding for this effective carbon pricing and whether uh, another carbon pricing system is um, yeah can be seen as an effective one. Uh, this is then part on, on a more global level when it comes to to commission. Um, so uh, we guess a voluntary scheme from, from uh, the information we received so far is uh, we need to stick to this annex uh, of the Q&A when it comes to ETS. Indeed, I can, I can confirm, confirm that. I mean, this is a list which requires uh, an assessment and we need to have a harmonized approach. So um, as I already mentioned in maybe in, in my intro, I mean, we will work there together with uh, the colleagues from the Director General for Climate Action to do um, an assessment if, um, of, of additional countries if there is interest to add additional countries to the list. And we will rely also to a very high degree on, on their expertise on, on, on this matter. <clears throat> uh, you also mentioned there this link to the carbon adjustment mechanism. There, well, it is clear that this is a separate exercise. So we are looking here um, specifically for the purposes of, of the RAT and for this delegated act in particular. Uh, so we are not uh, entering into the sphere. Okay. Um, so so did, did I understand right that DG Klima is working on a list of countries with which have a sufficient effective uh, carbon pricing because for example if we, if we look at chile where a large e-fuel plant is currently in construction um, chile has a co2 price of approximately according to the world bank um, five dollar per, per avoided ton of co2 it's government-led and it has penalties in place it has um, covered sectors like electricity heat and industry um, but it's probably, I don't know, um, not in line with the Paris goal. Um, um, how, to, how to deal with that cases and, and uh, what if I'm already invested in countries which are not on the list in the end? Well, first of all, 
well, we and our colleagues in particular, we have worked on this list. So there is a list. And um, then the next step would be then um, that we look at additional countries. So um, we are not currently working on all countries uh, to make this assessment. What we would look then there, we go there case by case, and then we could add additional uh, countries to the positive list. Um, but whether this is done is then the outcome of the assessment. So I cannot comment on the on the on the price or uh, on on the specifics of the case of Chile. So we would um, yeah we would look at it um, and um, and then yeah decide whether or not to add uh, additional uh, companies. Perfect. I can see so many questions in the chat. Um, we will try our best to collect and 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 structure them, and um, uh, we will send around a mail with a presentation and and list of questions afterwards. Um, we probably won't be able to answer all of them um, during during our lunch talk today. But I see a question from the U.S. startup Infinium. Um, David Zazinski um, is asking um, if you have a biogenic source. Um, how to certify that this biomass feedstock um, is um, uh, credible for, for the RFMBO production. Do you need a red cert certification, um, Timo, um, for the biomass in addition to the RFMBO, or how will it be done in practice? Okay, so when it comes to certifying biofuel production and the biomass uh, for this biofuel production so that we are having later on biogenic CO2, this is, would be, for example, our Red CDU certification scheme. Basically speaking, all voluntary schemes that are within is having the recognition for the biofuel production can be shown to demonstrate compliance. So if you are an RFMBO fuel producer and you are looking for biogenic uh, CO2, that is... Um, yeah, applicable under the criteria for the renewable energy directive the biomass itself needs to be certified according to to the requirements set out there in order to ensure that the biogenic co2 is from the sustainable sources there's an option in the q a uh, that uh, biogenic um, co2 which is not directly covered or within the uh, under the falls under the criteria of the renewable energy directive this can also be uh, in some cases be um, seen as a biogenic eligible site biogenic CO2 source but when it comes to the normal uh, procedure biofuel production the value chain of the biofuel needs to be certified according for example red CDU or other voluntary schemes perfect thanks and um, then there's a question on the energy used for water desalination and nitrogen production um, this need this also be in compliant with um, the delegated acts on RFMBO? Uh, yeah, so, so from, from uh, our understanding, no, but the upstream emissions arising due to the input needs to be considered within the GHG emission calculation from the RFMBO production. So therefore, the electricity does not need to comply with the, for example, fully renewable aspect, but the emissions arising due to the use of a certain input needs to be addressed within the GHG calculation. Okay, perfect. Um, so you have to take this into account um, to calculate your CO2 reduction, where you have a threshold of 70% compared to the fossil fuel um, reference of 94 gram per megajoule. Um, so let's switch the topics again. Um, I got a lot of questions on co-processing and, and um, hydrogen use as intermediate in refineries, um, for, for example. Um, starting um, maybe in general, um, Bernd, um, can you can you elaborate if it is possible to use H two um, um, to mix it by in, in refineries um, to conventional transport fuels or biofuel production? And um, what um, do I have to consider if I if I if I do something like this? I mean, our reading of of the, of the renewable energy directive that it has a distinct pathway there for for counting the RFMBO, which is used for the production of conventional transport fuels as well as as biofuels, and this is to count the the hydrogen which is used there directly towards the the targets for 
R three DOs. So this that also means that this hydrogen is uh, is not counted then a second time as a as a, as a, an R DO in in the output. And um, I mean, we have now the delegated act, um, which was based on the old red, and this re refers still to the old wording of the directive, which says that um, so the energy of um, um, of intermediate products which are used for the um, production of conventional fuels is is not count not considered um, in an update. This would likely then change to the energy for which is used for the production of conventional transport fuels and biofuels. It's not at least this is how how we see this at this stage because the red had well this was discussed during negations and the idea was to prevent double counting and also to keep it simple um, that that we do not have these cases where we have very slight. Um, uh, shares of of R and BO. So the question of the co-processing is not rather for the for the refining of oil products, but it is more when you have when you're constructing oil products from uh, yeah from from smaller molecules. So it's the it's a different um, process. So the Fischer Tropsch process in this case was um, was uh, in mind when when adding this reference to to co-processing in, in the delegated act. Okay, uh, and um, would you would you then consider all hydrogen consumption in a refinery as eligible for um, counting to to or being used as intermediates and counting on R and BO targets? Um, you know, you have different hydrogen demands for, for hydro cracking, maybe also for, for heat production or desulfonization, um, where the hydrogen molecule is not in the final product in the end, not in the transport fuel, um, but, but you have a hydrogen demand in the refinery. Yes. <clears throat> Generally, we, we, I mean, we have two different targets. We have a transport target and then we have the industry target. And there would not be double counting. So um this means that um, the hydrogen which is used in a refinery for the production of conventional transport fuels and um well if it's relevant biofuels depending what you call as a refinery uh, would be counted towards the transport target and all of it um and then you have the case where you are producing other uh, fuels so fuels which go to the heating sector, and the share of that would then be counted towards the uh, the industry target. And well, there would um, um, be then um, an assessment which is necessary, which fuels are then allocated to which which target, based on what is produced. Um, thanks. Um, Timo, do you want to add something here? Um, I'm, I'm sure you, you have your thoughts about um, co-processing uh, as well. Uh, yeah, co-processing uh, is obviously a quite complex topic. Also, that we have for, uh, additional rules when it comes to accounting for biogenic uh, hydrogen, which is also the, uh, there in, when it comes to co-processing. So I know that there is a lot of rules and also it's feeling sometimes like that co-processing is not um, every time that there's the pieces are not entirely fitting but this is just personally feeling otherwise I uh, when it comes to co-processing this is quite a complex topic um, therefore it's most of the time case by case sensitive so to say okay yeah um, I guess a lot of those things um, need to be um, done in practice, and there will be some trial and error, but uh, we, we have to see that we are also facing um, billions of investments, so you need a security on invest, and, and I think this is the challenges we, we are facing here right now. Um, one opportunity to, to relax um, the economic case um, would be to allocate um, the whole green hydrogen or green e-fuel amount to a dedicated product. Let's say um, all green hydrogen is um, being used as synthetic kerosene and the rest 
is fossil, although knowing that wire fish of drops, for example, not 100% kerosene is possible. Um, if I understand it right, um, Bernd, um, this is not wanted or not possible um, at the moment. Is it right? Well, this is indeed our, our interpretation. I mean, that's in a matter which is also discussed, but uh, so far our technical assessment was that this uh, is not possible. I mean, um, we have there um, a rule set out in the Renewable Energy Directive in Article 32, which points as um, at a proportional um, allocation, which also aims then to promote um, those processes uh, which um, which aim at a higher share of aviation um, or which not aim but I mean which which would help to um, to to uh, promote the situation that that we are we are invest that we're in incentivizing investments into uh, processes where we are producing fuels, where we also have then the offtake markets for the uh, for the Um So currently, we, as set out in our delegated act, we we see that we have indeed this proportionate uh, allocation, and this is also more in line with the rules for uh, we have for the production of biofuels, where we have a dedicated delegated act on co-processing. Uh, there, it is not strictly speaking a, a proportional uh, allocation, but uh, it is one which looks at the carbon content of the fuels and it looks it's tracing the um, yeah the uh, biogenic carbon which goes into the different product, which comes to something which is more similar to a proportionate um, allocation. Meaning, at least it is is not a free allocation, and also having this in in mind and keeping a level playing field uh, um, yeah points at uh, at a proportionate allocation um thanks uh, thanks a lot we are already two minutes over our time i don't know bernd and timo if you are 10 more minutes available or if you need to to run to the next meeting i have 10 minutes i have but not more than that Okay, um, Timo, you're, you're available as well. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, then um, I would like to ask Jan if we can bring in um, a, a speaker here. Um, I, I've seen um, the first person who sent the question. I don't know if um, she is still in the call, Svatlana van Babel, um, about, um, I think, co processing as well, co processing bio fuels and, and e-fuels via Fischer-Trop. Um, if you like, um, you can now unmute yourself, start your video, maybe shortly say who you are and for whom you're working and then raise your question because it's a lot. I don't want to read it here. Svetlana, you are ready to go, I think. It's unfortunately not working. Um, okay, then then I will just try to summarize. Um, she is writing in the chat. Um, some of carbon present in biomass will, in this case, be in, in vital, um emitted as CO2, um, since biomass by nature does not have the right combination of carbon and hydrogen for making hydrocarbons. So one part of the question is, um, if our NBOs um, have um, zero gram um, like biofuels, if they are accounted on the national balance um, 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 for, for, for different countries, according, I think, to UN criteria. And um, then the question is um, to fully utilize carbon present in biomass, the biofeedstock can be co-processed together with renewable hydrogen, e.g. via fissure trough pathways or similar resulting production can be seen as partially biofuels and partially RFMBOs. Will combustion emissions for RFMBOs part of the production be zero in this case? Um, I don't know, Timo, um, if you can say something to that. 
Uh, this is one example where like a drawing of the entire process would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but this is uh, whenever, uh, if I understood it correctly, when it comes to emissions from CO2 from biomass, and we are only producing a biomass fuel, the emissions itself would be considered uh, a zero emission. However, if it's once uh, directly included in the fuel in the RFMBO, the, this type of emission would then be uh, in emission. It needs to be accounted. However, this carbon dioxide in beforehand can be accredited, but I'm not entirely sure if I get the uh, direct the, the point of the question correctly. Therefore, a drawing would be really, really helpful. <laughs> Now, the, the trick is that you actually do not separate CO2. So it's more efficient if you just add hydrogen to syn gas, which is made out of biomass. And, and that's the question, because if you read the rules and it sounds like you have to count combustion emissions and it's not clear what you can subtract. But to start with, it is biogenic carbon, yeah, sustainable biomass, assuming Annex 9A feedstocks. Hence this confusion and just it's important to clarify this co-processing case. Maybe I can uh, start with our interpretation from such a case. Um, so we have two, two different relevant energy inputs uh, from from um, from our perspective. So the one derived from from biomass, the other one is an RFMBO. So we're therefore to determine the share of an RFMBO later on would be based on, on the energy input. Um, therefore, the, the carbon dioxide that we would be transferred to the RFMBO would, um, is the one that is later on present in the fuel. Um, so we have two, for, from our perspective, two production processes. One is a biofuel production, and the other one is really the one, only the hydrogen part and the CO2 part, for example, that is then later on uh, the RFMBO. Um, so again, this virtual process, transforming this hydrogen to an RFMBO, and in parallel, there's some sort of biofuel production. Um, but this is just our, our current understanding about this type of approach to relevant energy inputs, so to say. And, uh, and if I may to ask, relevant energy input will be on LHV basis, or or will you make distinction between what ends up molecular structure and what boosts heating value of the fuel? Um, this would normally do the LHV part. Yeah. But LHV I, part. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I, uh, if, if Mr. Kupfer, do you want to add something about this? Because I, I think this is a really interesting question, to be honest. <laughs> But I don't think that we can give a final answer to that. It sounds for me a bit that it could be possible. I mean, first of all, you make a distinction between the energy to see what this biofuel and what this renewable fuel. If you have then a bit more carbon available from the biomass, that this is also some then accounted as um, a certain amount of carbon which is avoided if it is sustainable. Of course, it needs to be then sustainable and then. You would do it as um, yeah as as for the carbon which is sustainable, which is captured in a way, but without that it becomes first CO two. But um, that's that this would be only kind of a, a ad hoc idea. So one needs to look really in, in detail how this 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 works. Okay. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Glad that it, it has technically worked. Um, thanks, Fadalana. Um, I have one more question from Matthias Olofsson from the Methanol Institute. And uh, I just know that he is from Iceland. He, of course, has a question to CO2 from um, geothermic um, or geological sources. Um, he is asking how to consider geothermal power plants um, because the delegates acts are saying CO2 has to be naturally emitted. Is a geothermal power plant where CO2 um, obviously um, is, is available um, something which is naturally or how to how to interpret the naturally em emit emission of, of geological CO2 sources? Bernd, maybe maybe you're the right one here. I'm the right one. Uh, to our understanding, I mean it's 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 not naturally emitted, so it, it's not falling under this. Category. This is at least my my interpretation on on, on that. Um, yeah. So I don't think I, I can can say say more than than that at this stage. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, there's um, there's also um, some one question about what the e-fuel alliance would like to change um, on the delegated acts and um, if. 
uh, or 10 minute um, expansion is already um, almost over. Um, I think it's, it's crucial that first movers, um, that they benefit um, from, from the regulation and that, um, that we are starting constructing and building those plans. For, for that reason, um, um, my opinion or our opinion is um, that um, we would like to start as, as early as possible and, and the grandfathering and exception of, of those rules, be it additionality, be it temporal or geographic correlation for the first few gigawatt um, of electrolyzer capacity, which also allows us to um, get closer to the targets of the European hydrogen strategy, that, that would be um, something which we can start. It would um, take a lot of risk um, from business development and, and uh, investments if we know uh, that, that the first, let's say, five gigawatt um, are excluded from those rules. And, and I think it would be a run on, on projects um, uh, for, for the first five gigawatt. Um, I know that after this, we will need um, those rules and, and it's good to have those rules. Um, but we see that a lot of projects are delayed or not taking place um, because um, they get they don't get finance the risk um, of or, or, or the, the misunderstandings or, or the, the, the answer that we don't have in the delegated acts. And, and that's, um, that's something which is worrying us a lot. Um, so, so our proposal would be expand the grandfathering um, to all criteria, um, at least for the first few gigawatt, um, if I can say so. Um, I would like to thank uh, my, my speakers, um, especially Ben, ben Kupko, of course. I think it's not usual that someone from the Commission who has worked out those documents and rules um, is um, answering all your questions. Um, I would love to repeat this um, as, as soon as possible. Uh, we have taken notes and, and know your questions. We will cluster them and, and try to discuss them with Timo and Bernd and, and send it back. Um, and I think we, we have to continue here. We have to work on this um, to provide our industry with more clarification about um, how, how to read those delegated acts. Um, thanks a lot. Um, have, a, have a nice week and see you at the next lunch talk um, of the EFUEL Alliance. Bye bye.